I appreciate that warm reception because police aren't uh, used to people being happy when they show up. <laughs> so it is nice for a change when people are smiling. Uh, I heard it once said that giving a talk or in your case hearing a talk is a lot like a wheel and that's the longer the spoke the greater the tire. <laughs> so I think that's why they've only given me 30 minutes to talk today because this is a topic that I could probably go on for for several hours and still really only scratch the surface of it. But you see the title is fraud prevention and <clears throat> sadly there really is no such thing as fraud prevention. Uh, fraud's been around forever and will continue to be and will continue to change and evolve and as technology changes, but my job when I give these uh, presentations is really fraud mitigation. I'm trying to give you some, uh, maybe some tips and some tools for the tool belt that might assist you in making yourself a more difficult target of fraud. And that's really all we can hope, uh, we can hope for. Uh, I'm used to walking around during my presentations and, and being very interactive and informal, and so I'm a little restricted by this podium, but you'll have to forgive me for that. But I do quite a few of these presentations, and I'm always asked, you know, why, why policing? You know, why uh, in your position do you, would you do a job that's seemingly uh, thankless? Uh, why do you do a job where you need to be training continually? You need to be working continually uh, on fitness and education? And, and I thought, you know what? Uh, it's easier to show, to show you the reason as opposed to telling you. So. I get, I get a little kickback from Krispy Kreme every time I show that video. <laughs> but I, I like to set the tone early. You, gotta, you, you see where this is going now. Uh, it is very informal, and, and, and usually I entertain questions as we go, but obviously there's a question and answer period at the end. So, uh, Our economic crimes unit deal with these types of things. Anything fraud related is what we're looking at. If it's something that might be a little more time consuming or complex that our frontline uniformed officers can't deal with or don't have the time to deal with, uh, it'll come to our office and we'll have a look at it. This is what we wanna, we're going to cover today. And like I said, I'm really going to be rushing through this because typically I spend an hour or so talking about these, these issues. But we're going to talk, spend a little time on a topic called, known as phishing and, ex and, and explain what that is. Then we're going to talk about what I refer to as the big three. These are three scams that we see over and over and over again. Every few years they'll come back with a new coat of paint uh, and maybe look a little bit different, uh, but they're basically the same. And then we'll, we'll end off with some of the trends that we're seeing, some things that are up and coming uh, that are of concern to us right now. But fishing, who's heard of this? Who, oh good, a lot of hands. Excellent. Sometimes I get blank stares when I talk about fishing or somebody's picturing themselves you know on the lake in a boat um, but in this particular case what is it shout it out I heard it looking for information somebody in a, in a figurative sense they are fishing for personal information right now I need you to take a minute and memorize that because that will be on the test at the end uh, <laughs> It's a very wordy definition, but ultimately it means it's an email, a text message, um, a fake website, anything that's designed to look legitimate, but its purpose is to extract information from you that can then be used to defraud you, steal your identity, things like that. So we're going to spend a little time helping you identify some of this stuff. And we found that in all of these phishing emails or these phishing websites, there are some uh, things that are consistent throughout. First of all is the content. There's always, always, always urgency to it. It's something you need to do right now, okay? Why is that? Well, bad guys know if you have a chance to think about it and shake your head, uh, you're probably going to realize it's a scam. So that's one thing to look for. There are always certain trigger words. They want you to update your information or validate it or confirm it. Almost without fail, one of those three words will appear, okay? Uh, the bank already has your password and your PIN. They don't need you to confirm it in an email or over the telephone. And then the third thing is brand spoofing, and that's just a, 
a strange name for, meaning they'll take a, a, a graphic, a logo, uh, something off a legitimate website, put it on their website or in their email to make it look legitimate. So it might be the logo for RBC or, or something like that. Some of them are very good, but if you look at a lot of them, maybe the coloring's off, the graphics are a little fuzzy, uh, they're stretched or shrunk, and, and, you can, and you can tell sometimes just by looking that it's a bad, a bad website. So here's an example of an actual uh, phishing email. It uh, claims to come from the RBC Financial Group, and it's got English on it and French, so it's got to be real. <laughs> right? No, no bad guy is going to go to the trouble to put English and French on their scam letter. Okay? So it says Royal Bank Financial Group has detected a problem with your account. Okay, that doesn't sound good. And then it goes on to say we want you to connect to your account and verify transactions. Okay? There's one of those keywords, <coughs> verify. And they want you to click on a secured URL. Now, we could spend a whole day on computer techie type stuff too, but a URL is just an address on the internet. Okay? So they want you to kick, click on that blue link and take you to the Royal Bank website on the internet. There's a problem with that. That address that you see there in blue is in fact the actual address for the Royal Bank website. However, if you click on that website, the address that you are actually going to be redirected to appears at the bottom of your browser or at the bottom of your email. Might be a little blurry and a little bit hard to see uh, in the back. But if you take your mouse and you take the pointer and you hover that pointer over top of that link, over top of that URL address, but don't click it, just move the pointer over top, the bottom of your browser will show you the address that you are really going to. Does that make sense? Yeah. Right here. <coughs> so if you click on that, that's where you're going. Now, if the address, the URL they want you to click on and the URL that shows up at the bottom are not the same, well, in the biz, we call that a clue, okay? <laughs> now, if I, if I had a big giant red flag up here, I'd be waving that, saying red flag. Now, nothing's 100%, but that's one thing to look for, is if that, those addresses aren't the same, uh, that's a giant red flag. One other thing. Before every internet address, there's HTTP or HTTPS. The S means that is a secure website. That means all traffic going into and out of that site is encrypted and no one can intercept it. So your, your major retailers, your online retailers, your banks, your financial institutions, their websites are secure. They will all have HTTPS. If you look at the bottom where you're being redirected, it's, you, well, you can't see it. It says HTTP, so you're being redirected to an insecure website where they're then going to get you to put your information in and they have, they've got your bank number, they've got whatever you give to them. All right, so it's my job to be suspicious. Uh, most people, by nature, I think, aren't suspicious. Right? We're raised to uh, play nice in the sandbox and share our toys with others and get along with everybody, and it's not our nature to just be distrusting of people. But if you are a little bit suspicious when it comes to these types of things, you might save yourself some grief. Okay? Uh, financial financial uh, institutions, credit card companies, they are not going to send you an email to verify anything. They might send you information on promotions, but they are not going to request over the phone or email or any other way to input SIN numbers, dates of birth, passwords, account numbers, things like that. You know for a fact that's going to be a scam. If you're in doubt, if you have a question, the common sense thing to do is contact the organization. Now, don't contact the organization using the phone number that they provide you in the email. Because <laughs> on the other end of that line is Jimmy Two Shoes waiting to answer the phone and continue the fraud, okay? Get your phone book out, look, at, look up the publicly listed number for the Royal Bank or Walmart or whatever it is, and phone them and say, is this a scam? Uh, never eaten, these are common sense. I'm not telling you anything you don't already know, right? In the comfort and warmth and security of this room, this is all perfectly normal and makes sense. But for some reason, when we're by ourselves in our home offices in front of our computers, it sounds like a good idea to click on this email. Don't email personal or financial information ever. And avoid those embedded links 
those URLs that are inside the emails they want you to click on, don't click them, unless you know for sure that came from a, a safe place, a, a, a secure source. Look at the website's address line, we talked about that. Make sure that your firewall, your antivirus, all that stuff is up to date. And if what I just said to you is Greek, talk to a son or a daughter or a grandson or a granddaughter <laughs> who's computer savvy and say, is my computer secure? And make sure all that stuff is up to date. And then regularly check your bank statements. And I would add to that, get your credit, request your credit report from Equifax or TransUnion to see if, and I'll have contact information for them at the end. All right, the big three. These are, first one is lottery scams. Now, I, I, I call it lottery scam, but that's a broad category of scams. That's anything from the Nigerian letter that you get saying, you know, you're the only lone survivor of this billionaire who's been exiled and they need your help to get money into the country, to, uh, you know, the, you've won a trip, or you've a casino lottery, or a sweepstakes, a uh, publisher's clearinghouse type um, sweepstakes, okay? So all of those things are categorized as a lottery scam. A bit of a scary number here. This is the most recent one that I can get from uh, the Anti-Fraud Center. It's a, a 2014. This is only in Canada. This is only mass marketing fraud. So this is only one category of fraud, which is this lottery type scam. scam. In 2014, only in Canada, over $74 million was lost to this type of scam. So obviously people are not coming to my seminars <laughs> because that's a scary money, uh, amount of money, right? So here, here's some tools, okay, to put in the tool belt. Normally at this part, part of my presentation, I actually have people participate. I deputize everybody in the room and I have you look at an actual lottery letter and tell me what's wrong with it. Uh, we're going to just go through that together for the sake of time. If you are a legitimate winner of a sweepstakes or a lottery, you're not going to be notified by email. Now I put an asterisk by that because that used to be the case 100% of the time. That is changing with technology. If you have entered certain provincial lotteries now, you may get email notification that you have won. Generally not. The numbers are published. It's up to you to figure out if you're the winner or not. Okay. The second one on that list, I'm almost embarrassed that I have to put on a slide. <laughs> you cannot win without entering. Okay? <laughs> We're all chuckling. But I put it on that slide for a reason. Because this gets a lot of people. And this one and the third point are related. Okay? They don't randomly select an email or a phone number or a name out of the phone book or a big bin or whatever to randomly award a prize to. The reason that we fall for these is because we are so conditioned today to give out our information to everybody. If you shop at Safeway, they know your email address, they have your phone number, they know your name. Uh, I can't go to Radio Shack and buy batteries without them wanting my postal code, right? So we find ourselves rationalizing, well, yeah, I shop at Safeway, so why wouldn't Safeway have a draw and maybe just draw my email out? Because I, I shop there, they've got my information, it makes perfect sense. The difference there is, did you actively enter something? Okay. Unless you find yourself typing out an entry form or writing out an entry form and mailing it somewhere, you have not entered. And if you have not entered, you cannot win. Okay. So, next one, they're not going to tell you to keep your winnings secret. It's not confidential. As soon as somebody says, shh, don't tell anybody you won, big red flag. Okay. And this last one. Uh, when you leave this meeting today and you forget everything else the nice policeman had to say, just remember this last one because it will save you. This last one, if you remember nothing else today, will save you. And it is this. If you have legitimately won something, you will never, ever, 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 ever have to pay anything up front. It, it doesn't matter if they're calling it shipping and handling. It doesn't matter if they're calling it taxes. It doesn't matter if they're calling it insurance. It doesn't matter what it is. The second somebody says you need to give us some money first, right? We're beyond red flag there. That's guaranteed scam. You never have to pay anything in any form first to claim your prize. Did we beat that one to death? 
Now, I put a few of these on the tables uh, if you want to refer to them because there's no way you're going to be able to see it up here. This is a lottery letter. I hesitate to do this because I'm afraid people are going to find out how easy it is to do my job. All right? But we're going to go through a few problems with this. This is a very typical scam email or letter you might get in the mail. If there aren't enough on the tables, I apologize. Just share with your neighbor. Uh, normally, I would give you time to go through this and come up with the answers on your own. But starting right at the top, there's a problem. That impersonal greeting. Now, if you really won something, at the very least, they'd know who you are, right? <laughs> now, if your name does appear on there, doesn't mean it's real. just means they did some homework and they're targeting you specifically. But in this case, it says, dear winner. What should that say? Dear sucker, <laughs> right? <laughs> Maybe dear loser, if they want to really be hurtful. All right, so there's the first problem. Another one, and these are, these are I'm just ticking off the points that I just told you on my last slide. Here uh, in that section there that's underlined, it says you are randomly selected. Your com compu random computer generated selection. Well, we know that's a problem, okay? Next one down the list. We didn't talk about this, but this one's quite common too. Poor grammar or spelling, all right? Now, I used to be an English teacher, so I'm particularly sensitive to these letters when it looks like a grade two student wrote it, or obviously someone that doesn't speak English natively. Uh, what does it say there? I like to read this one out loud because it's fun. You are also advice to keep your claim number confidential to avoid duplication or loss of claim. <laughs> okay? Enough said on that. In that same line, another red flag. You're asked to keep the news confidential. Don't tell anybody about it. We know that's a problem. And then the last one, the big one. They want you to send them some money. Now, in this case, they sent you a check first. And they want you to deposit it and send back a little bit. Mm. We're going to talk about that at the end here, under trends, OK? But we know that's a problem. All right. Next one. Uh, this one I call the Microsoft scam. It doesn't involve Microsoft, but it in involves sometimes you getting a phone call and someone claiming to be from Microsoft. Uh, who here in the room, just by show of hands, who's ever received a phone call saying your computer's full of viruses and we need to fix it for you? <laughs> Look at that. Three quarters of the hands in the room. Okay. Uh, I bet everybody in this room has experienced at least one of these scams that we're talking about today in one form or another. Okay. This one we only need to spend one minute on. This is, we already know what it is. They're claiming to be phone-based tech support and they want to help you with your computer. If you don't own a computer, and you get this call. <laughs> yeah, I see some thumbs, thumbs up at the back. All right, you're probably okay. You're, you're probably not going to fall for it. All right, I'm not going to say that 100% of the time, but most people aren't going to fall for that if you actually don't own a computer. But what can happen if you do fall for it? If they get you going along, they can install malicious software on your computer that can take control of your computer. They can remotely take control of your computer and access sensitive information. If you do online banking, they'll have access to all that information. Uh, they can lock your computer or put a virus on it and basically hold it hostage. Now you have to pay them to get it fixed because they're the only ones that can do it. Um, they can direct you to a phishing website like we talked about where they then get you to input credit card information or, or other things. So it's kind of a scary scenario once somebody has taken control of your computer you have no idea what's going on with it. And at the end of the day, it's going to require an expensive repair bill to make sure that your, your computer is safe. So really, all you need to know, that call is a scam each and every time. Microsoft, nor any of its affiliates, nor any legitimate uh, tech company will call you unsolicited and offer you services for your computer. Okay, That's all you need to know. And all you need to do, let me hear it. Hang up the phone. That's all you need to do. Don't antagonize. You know what? Some people like to sort of string them along when they know it's a scam and have a little fun with them. If you want to do that, that's your call. But I would recommend don't antagonize them. Just let them know you're not interested and hang up the phone. That way you're, they're not going to bother calling back and they're not going to you're not going to have any further problem with them. So, all right. Third one. Third one of the big three. I call the grandparent scam. Who here, by show of hands, has received a phone call from someone claiming to be a grandson or granddaughter who needs immediate financial assistance? Oh, only one. Okay. 
and a couple, or know of some people that have, okay? Yeah. yeah. My own parents have had this phone call. And uh, typically it's a grandchild claiming to be in trouble. I am in jail, I was traveling, I was going to a concert somewhere, I got into a car accident, I'm in jail, I need money for bail, please don't tell mom, she's gonna be so upset. Um, and, and here's a nice police officer you can talk to. Okay, so typically it's, there's gonna be more than one person involved. You'll have somebody claiming to be a police officer, claiming to be a lawyer, claiming to be a doctor, and uh, it sounds legitimate, but it's not. So, like with all these scams, Number one, resist that urgency. Resist the urge to act fast, because they know if you have time to think about it, you're gonna realize what's going on. So, let's play, let's say just for the sake of argument, this is a real phone call. Your grandson or granddaughter was caught driving drunk, got in a car accident, and they're in jail. Let them sit there for a couple of hours. <laughs> they probably deserve to be there for a while, right? Okay, well, that's your call. Anyways, <laughs> resist that urge to act quickly. Do all you can to contact somebody. Contact the family, contact a boss, contact a relative. Do not do anything to you verified, is this your grandson or granddaughter, okay? And never send money, ever, based on a phone call, based on an email, based on something sight unseen, because you just don't know, okay? We could spend a lot of time talking about that. Uh, one more thing you can do, and this is more preemptive, um, if many of you have grandkids, um, what you can do basically is just take them out before they have a chance to grow up and give you any trouble. Please don't send letters to the chief saying Constable Shirts is showing inappropriate videos. That was, no one was hurt, that was just fake. <laughs> All right, we're gonna wrap this up real quick here. Some of the trends that we're seeing now is this overpayment scam. And I'm just going to play a quick news video for this. If you use online classified ads to sell things, be careful. The FBI says there's been a spike in what it calls an overpayment scam. And they tell us all of the cases investigated involve Craigslist. Diana Coe has this action line consumer alert. A woman decided to sell her ring on Craigslist. So she put it up on Craigslist for $650. She then received a notification from a potential buyer saying, hey, I'm interested in buying your ring, but I'm not there right now. Can I send you a cashier's check or money order? This is the start of what the FBI calls an overpayment scam, where fraudsters play the role of buyer and target consumers selling a product or service. Even though she's selling the ring for $650, she receives a cashier's check in the mail for $2,000. The buyer asked her to deposit it into her bank account and wire him the difference. She got suspicious and called the FBI, who told her to play along while they monitor it. So as soon as she deposits that money and then withdraws her own money to send a wire transfer, a couple days later her bank will be notified that that is a worthless item that she's deposited. The buyer theoretically loses the money, though this woman lost neither her ring nor her cash. Simon says Craigslist is great, but best used for local, hand-to-hand -hand transactions. Diana Co, KHON2 News. So that, that scam, that overpayment scam, comes in many different forms. But if at any point you receive money in the form of a check or something and you're asked to deposit it and quickly send money back, and usually it's Western Union or MoneyGram, there's another giant red flag, you know it's a scam, it's an overpayment scam. The last one I'm gonna mention, and this one is very uh, recent, is the Canada Revenue uh, Agency scam. Who here's got a message on their machine letting them know they have a warrant for their arrest? Okay, keep your hands up, I need to write some names down. I need to see, uh, one, 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 one. okay. I'll, I'll, I'll have you know that I actually have a warrant as well uh, from Canada Revenue Agency because I have uh, you know tax evasion and what's not. So, uh, again, we could spend lots of time talking about the, the nuts and bolts of these, but if you've got a call from Canada Revenue saying that you owe taxes, that uh, they've applied for a warrant, uh, they're sending a police officer to, officer to your house, you know it's a fraud, you know it's a scam, you know it's fake. That scares a lot of people. Some of them are convincing, and some of them you know immediately based on an accent or poor grammar or something that they're, they're not, uh, but those, that frightens a lot of people. Okay. Oh, we've come a long way in a short amount of time. Let's wrap this up. If it sounds too good to be true, holy smokes, your father was right. <laughs> it is. Okay. Who would have thought dad was right when he said that? Okay. 
Remember those red flags. Be wary if you have to pay something up front or first. That's a big one. Don't ever provide personal or financial information, right? Email, text, phone. Be suspicious, again, if you have to act fast, there's that urgency, or you have to keep it a secret. And uh, if it sounds too good to be true, I might have said that already. Yeah, it is. Okay. If you've been scammed, I'm going to leave this slide up during the lunch break here, so if you want to take any of that information down, you can. But the steps you need to take if you have been scammed uh, is contact the financial institutions, stop the hemorrhaging, make sure the accounts are closed, cards are canceled, things like that. Contact the credit bureaus, have them put a fraud alert uh, on your name so you'll be, a, you'll be notified if anybody applies for credit in your name. Contact the local police, let them start an investigation. And you can report these phishing emails to the Canadian Anti-Fraud Centre and all that contact information is up there. So uh, I appreciate your time this afternoon and I look forward to addressing any questions that you might have after the break. Thanks.